hi everyone and uh and welcome um uh before we start i just want to uh pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land that centers on the wolgarukaba and bindal peoples um I think uh, given that many of us spend uh, a lot of time in boats, it's perhaps somewhat uh, fitting that the name of the traditional owners uh, around here literally translates to, uh, to canoe people. Um, and so we'd like to pay our respect to their elders, uh, past, present, and, and future. Um, so before I introduce Phil, I'd like to take just a few minutes to discuss something as the new uh, co-director of, uh, of program one, which is, is people and nature. Um, 2020 has seen a lot of big changes. Uh, COVID's um, a, a very obvious one, uh, but also the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which, uh, which was sparked in the US, but has really resonated, um, uh, I think, all over the world. Uh, for many of us here at the center, we probably feel pretty removed from this movement. Um, as scientists, most of us probably identify both socially and politically as progressives, and, and feel that you know we believe in social justice but this, we, it, this doesn't really have much to do with us and i'd like to challenge this notion just for a moment um, by highlighting the role uh, of science in supporting structural racism and i think you know the best known examples might be the role of anthropologists in the eugenic movement which sought to class races as superior or inferior based on things like skull measurements and i guess that's no wonder why anthropologists have gone so qualitative now given that their first uh, their first foray into quantitative science really resulted in a lot of genocide. Um, within geography, the study of race uh, factored prominently in the paradigm of environmental determinism, where climate and other physical factors were held to in part determining factors that would influence the social and behavior characteristics of, uh, of different races. And, and you might think ecology is different, but Think about the strong colonial legacy of, of ecology, how present day research stations are often situated in colonial outposts and how if you're, you're going uh, to, to uh, places in, in, in developing countries and, and taking resources, which in, in our case is data and knowledge and bringing that back and, and, and publishing it. Um, it's, a, it's an extension of, of the colonial legacy. So I'd like to talk about four ways that I think I think there's a lot of room for improvement in in, uh, in in how we how we do research in our center in ways that we can uh, sort of decolonize uh, the way that we do research. And I'd like to talk about sort of four pillars of that that I think uh, many of us could could uh, integrate into our own research. And and the first is is about bias and language. And I'd like to just briefly read a quote from a, a good article called "Decolonizing Field Ecology." It says. Researchers should act to make visible the structural privileges that are integral in the production of knowledge. It matters what passports we carry, the color of our skin, our assigned sex, where we work and study, and the languages we speak, because their perceived status is tied to histories of colonial domination and exploitation. We each owe our ability to be heard to desirable passports, to whiteness, and affiliation to prestigious institutions. And so think about these biases in your own work and consider adjusting the language and the framing that you use as a quote unquote neutral observer, right? So don't call your field site in Papua New Guinea or wherever remote. If people live there, it's only remote to you and, you know, to the global north. It's actually home to someone else. Uh, I'd like to talk about knowledge co-production as the kind of second pillar of that. How can you work with local people to generate science that's relevant to them? And the third is, is co-authorship. Can you involve local assistance as co-authors uh, co or is your authorship system set up to exclude them that they can collect data, but then after that, they're not invited, they, they don't have any input further along the line. Can you, can you change your pipeline of authorship so that people that are involved early in the process may be able to, to, uh, to be involved later in the process? And the last part is communication. Uh, returning results is critical, but it's often left out of research grants. So, you know, can you write this into your research grants? And, you know, if you have great results from existing projects, talk to us. Um, we've really curtailed our, our research budgets and some funds may be available to do some innovative ways to consider uh, presenting results back to communities. Okay, so without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Phil Levin. Uh, it's safe to say that Phil is an interesting character. 
Uh, he's originally a, a marine fish guy, but we won't hold that against him. Uh, Phil not only straddles the natural and social science divide, he also straddles the scientist practitioner divide. He's the lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy in Washington State, but also is a professor of practice at the University of Washington. He's published over 150 scientific papers and won numerous awards, including the Department of Commerce Silver Award and NOAA's Bronze Medal for his work on marine ecosystems, and the Seattle Aquarium's Conservation Research Award for his work in Puget Sound. Um, Phil's a lot of fun to have a beer with and was nice enough to invite uh, Michelle and I out to Seattle uh, recently to launch an Ocean Modeling Forum working group, but he obviously planned it very poorly and didn't take into account the global pandemic that, uh, that we're having now, so we actually had to do it remotely. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you guys are, uh, if we ever open our borders and you're going through Seattle, I highly recommend uh, taking a swing through where, where Phil's at. He's, he's a lot of fun and I uh, very much look forward to hearing you what he's going to talk about today. So Phil, over to you. Thanks, Josh. I wasn't sure where you're going to go with that. <laughs> um, it's really a pleasure to be uh, with you in Australia today or my basement. Um, and um, yeah, th here's one thing I'll just throw in randomly. Um, so I went to, so my PhD advisor was Peter Sale, who when I applied <clears throat> was at the University of Sydney. And he worked, you know, this was going to be my career. And then he immediately left before I got there. I went to the University of New Hampshire. And I um, still thought I was going to work on coral reefs. And I'm still waiting someday to work on a coral reef. So this is um, zooming to you guys from my basement is the closest I've gotten so far. So thanks. Um, and I can't even tell if anybody reacted to that. This is a weird thing about Zoom. I'm, but I'm just sharing my screen. <clears throat> Share. All right, is that good? We don't know. I'm just gonna, cool. See, thumbs up. Um, Sorry, I'm fussing with my thing here. Um, so today what I want to talk about is really sort of the notion of sustainability. Um, generally around kind of anything we do in conservation, but um, really I'm going to talk, as you'll see, a lot about fish um, and fisheries because I like fish and fisheries. Um, and before I go um, too far, um, I just want to acknowledge that um, everything I'm showing you was done in collaboration with a ton of people. Um, and, you know, the cliche really applies to me. That is, if I say I, I mean we, and if I say we, I mean they. So thanks to all my colleagues and collaborators and friends. Um, So, or the government, like I have for a while, <clears throat> everybody kind of wants to know when you're done. So, because they gave you money and they want to know that they got their money's worth and that you succeeded. So, what does success look like? And so, it's something that I really, really think about a lot and I struggle with a lot. And mole is over and over my brain. Am I done? Have I succeeded? Have I let people down? Have I? spent money appropriately, that sort of thing. And um, today what I want to do is really kind of turn over this topic of what it means to succeed, who gets to define what success is. And a little bit this plays off of um, or follows on to Josh's remarks open in, that he opened with. And I am um, want to start with a story that I heard um, on a in the States, a short story that really struck me, and I carry it with me and think about this a lot. Um, the story goes, um, there was uh, an airplane, and there, oh, uh, an elderly woman sat down on the airplane, 
Um, she's getting comfortable and kind of settles in. And then the flight attendant uh, brings a four-year-old child traveling alone and to the woman and says, do you mind if um, she sits here? And, and for sure, she's sure um, welcomed, you know, this little girl to sit next to her. And it was a girl's first flight. And I don't know where she was going. They didn't tell me. She's going someplace all alone. The plane takes off. Um, and the girl, you know, just staring out the window, fascinated, enthralled, you know, like a kid is on their first flight. And she um, looks down as the plane goes up into the sky and she turns to the woman and she says to the woman, when do we get smaller? And that struck me. It's like, it's perfectly logical, right? That kid has only seen a plane from the ground. And when the plane goes up into the sky, the plane gets smaller. So from her frame of reference, from her perspective, of course, she's going to get smaller. And what I like about that is it's, you know, it's like it's her perception is based completely on her experience. And so when we start going through our own work and our own science and drawing conclusions and trying to decide what's sustainable, what's success, what's not. It's really, for me, I always think, about, think back about the lens through which I've experienced the world and view things. And I want to start kind of, kind of turning over this idea a little bit, moving from and stuff and in Puget Sound. And I just want to describe this one study we did a couple of years ago now, um, where we were really interested in eelgrass restoration. So eelgrass, as you know, around the world is a really important habitat for a lot of commercially important species. In my area, it's important for salmon and, and crabs and herring and a number of other things that support cultures and fisheries and recreational opportunities. Um, and we wanted to know um, basically, what was ecologically possible in terms of restoration, but also what do people want? Like, what does success look like to the citizens of Puget Sound? Um, and so what we thought we would do, and this is um, a few years ago, perhaps I was naive, I thought I could just go out, basically, and ask people, how much eelgrass do you want? You know? And I could tell them, look, this is how much it's going to cost um, to do like a restoration project or whatever. And just, you know, tell me. Um, well, it turns out nobody actually, one, knows, or two, cares. So it's back to the drawing board for the proto-social scientist. What we ended up doing was a little bit more complicated. And in this case, what we did was we started... with um, build for a system. In this case, it had a bunch of different um, functional groups and um, you know, sort of the usual thing. And then we said, okay, imagine we could change eelgrass in this model, what happens? So in this plot, you can see basically restoration, a lot of restoration is in green, reduction is in um, red here. So, and these are a bunch of different species. And it turns out that if you, you add more eelgrass, species that like eelgrass do better. So that was a remarkable finding. Um, perhaps more interesting are some of the indirect effects. Um, so in this case, basically you have um, two alternative stable states in, in our system. Um, one, which is sort of an eelgrass dominates um, system that supports eagles, um, and another that's um, more of a kind of a sandy mud system that's going to support gulls. And so there are actually these two alternate stable states. The result simply from changing the amount of eelgrass in the system. So we get this idea that um, eelgrass is important to people, perhaps not because of its eelgrass, but rather because of the things that eelgrass supports. Um, iconic species.
species in our area, like recreational and commercial species like crabs, and lots of people love birds. So if we begin to start saying, yeah, we're not going to change eel groups, but what we're talking about are, are um, eagles and killer whales, people start paying attention. But of course, restoration of eelgrass requires that we reduce threats. Um, and here are the, the main ones that we deal with in our area, armoring overwater structures like piers, sediment loading, and nutrients. And then there's costs associated with those. So what if, rather than asking how much eelgrass do you want, we ask what kind of system do you want and how much are you willing to pay for it? So, uh, so, so sorry so to interrupt did, for a sec. You're um, you're dropping out occasionally, and I wonder if you turned off your video. If there'd be more more bandwidth coming through, because uh, yeah. we can just see the the screen there, and that might uh, that might stop the 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 breakdown. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, I should maybe tell my kid to stop streaming Netflix. Um, okay, so um, so then what we did was we created these scenarios where we ask what's the impact of human activities on seagrass how does that affect species and how much does that cost oops so um and and what we're trying to communicate through these scenarios is that our future is a package deal you don't get killer whales you don't get salmon without um thinking about urban growth and climate change and all the things that come with that. And then we could go out and ask people with a variety of different scenarios that are driven by eelgrass restoration, what kind of future do you want to see? Um, and just this is just very simplistic uh, and brief. Uh, you can read the paper if you want more detail, but just to give you a sense. So in this case, you know, overall the people we asked, several um, hundreds of, of people um, in various uh, focus groups, um, you see that there's a peak someplace around 15% restoration gives them the benefits that they're interested in um, at a cost that's acceptable. Um, the interesting thing these days is, um, so you could break people down by um, party, you know, so we have Democrats and Republicans. I'm told that they think about the world differently. But what's interesting in this case is that they actually um, have similar um, peaks. Um, so around, again, that kind of 10 to 12, 15%. Um, Republicans have less tolerance for increased costs with more, um, with more restoration. And of course, uh, nobody likes it. If you go out here where you have 45% increase in eelgrass, nobody likes that. Um, that's because um, there's no people and everybody wants to be there. So, you know, the news flash from this is, um, well, people see the world um, differently um, and people have different ideas about what they and how much um, like they're willing to pay and what they want to see in terms of, of restoration. But there are commonalities. Um, and so, you know, with that kind of lesson in my back pocket, I wanted to switch and, and take this same sort of note. And in this case, sort of, I, I started with this idea that when I was at NOAA, we had this sort of graphic um, where we showed that only 18% uh, of the species US wide, 15% on the Pacific coast are overfished. And the vast majority of species are not overfished. Um, and this is kind of new for us. We, we had some problems and we rebuilt fisheries. And in 2002, towards the beginning of my time when I was working at NOAA, um, there's this on the left came out, which was basically, there was a federal disaster um, and it seemed in, that um, fish were just disappearing. And in some sense they were, listed under the Endangered Species Act in a couple of cases. Um, and fast forward just a few years later, um, people are talking about this remarkable recovery. So we could view this as just this huge success, an idea where, you know, this sustainable management worked. 
Um, and then recently there was a paper that came out that got a lot of press, which you know basically asked the question, does fisheries management work at big spatial scales? And the quote from the author of that paper was, the answer is emphatically yes, it's working. Um, and again, evidence on the west coast of the US um, where we had this remarkable recovery. So I think I wanna just say, hey, hang on. Um, is that really what we mean by success? Is that really what we mean by sustainable? Is that really the state of the system that everyone would agree is the desirable state? Um, and I'm inspired as I sort of moved from kind of more Puget Soundy stuff to this, um, to this question, um, this quote from a Coast Salish or indigenous people here in Puget Sound um, this quote where he talks about seafood is, is part of us. It's who we are. So if you're not able to go out on the beaches and the tides with my family, I wouldn't even have that moment of this is what our people have done for thousands of years and what we are still continuing to do. It's, um, it's more than just, um, you know, numbers of fish and ability to sell fish. There's something much more to it as, I think you will know. Um, and so that led me this, you know, now to, to Haida Gwaii. Uh, it's a place where I've been working for about a decade. Haida Gwaii is an archipelago about 100 kilometers off the coast of northern British Columbia. There's about 150 islands bigger than a kilometer. Um, Haida Gwaii is um, inhabited from time immemorial of the Haida people. Um, who depend and rely intimately on Pacific herring. It's probably second to salmon in terms of cultural importance to the Haida. Herring are really interesting um, because they have this central role ecologically. They're basically everything eats them. Um, whales to fish, um, it's really sort of this centerpiece of the food web. But they also support an intense commercial fishery. Um, and the thing that I think that makes them really special for a pelagic fish is herring come to shore, Pacific herring particularly, come to shore to spawn. Um, and you see here the, the sperm in, in the water as they come to people to spawn. They lay their eggs on kelp. Um, this... Um, the eggs then are just fuel the terrestrial food web. So bears, wolves, everything comes in and just got, gorges themselves along the shoreline as algae washes uh, loose and in, in, in the inner tidal. And then for the height of people, um, the, this row on kelp cow in the um, height of language is one of the most important foods uh, for them. And so herring is central to the people, herring is central to the food web, and, it's, and herring is central to a lot of people's livelihoods. Um, but herring are in trouble, and we begin to get a sense of this if we look at this um, map. So this is, shows you, white shows you where the herring are spawning, um, and you'll see here there's, I don't, I think you can see my cursor, um, 1947 is the um, year. And I'm just going to play this forward, and you'll see it go through time. And what you'll notice is that um, where herring spawns kind of bounces around. Some places are visited a lot year after year after year. Some places only occasionally. Um, and you see there's quite a, a bit of variation. And over time, um, you get a sense that um, uh, there's sort of a disappearance of spawning sites. An elder, um, a Haida elder, used to say that you could just look at a map like we just did and everywhere you used to get herring spawn. So from his vantage point, everywhere you looked, you got herring spawn. And that's because every place that herring spawned used to be a Haida village. And we can look at um, data of herring spawning over, over the last 
a few decades, um, individual stocks are these kind of colored lines and the mean is shown here in the dark line with, um, and these are rescaled so that zero is considered a sustainable biomass of herring. And um, you see two things. One is that there's a lot of noise in the time series of individual stocks, but the portfolio overall is less volatile. So it's a typical portfolio effect that we see. Um, and you see a couple crashes. There was a crash here in the early 60s that was caused by a reduction in fishery. Um, so the fish were caught, sent off for meal, mostly in oils. Um, but the fishery was closed and it bounced back really rapidly. Um, another fishery started again later on and there was another crash. This was a, a, a row fishery for uh, the sushi market in Asia. The stock crashed and didn't recover very quickly. But at the very end of this time series, you see it bounced up across the zero line, so the sustainable line. So when that happened, um, the Canadian government opened up the fishery and then um, things went a little bit, um, uh, people went ballistic because they did not want the fishery open. And by people, I mean the indigenous people. So there were blockades, um, building government buildings were taken over. Um, it was quite an event. So the question is why were people so upset? So we can begin to get at this if we sort of look at what was actually happening on the water. So in this graph, what I'm showing here is proportion of the stock that's harvested with, with about 25% being considered sustainable by the government. And you see mostly they do pretty good. So overall, the this, this stock in Haida Gwaii very rarely did the fishing effort go above uh, 0.25. And, when, and you can see it's kind of associated with some crashes that I mentioned, but generally people are doing pretty well. That's over the entire area. But if we look only where people fish. So we would go to fished sites and ask the question, how much of the fish in those sites did people take? Um, what you see is a different story. So um, here, generally, you can see something like maybe 50% of the fish were taken. And this makes sense if you think about it from a fisherman's perspective. The idea is you would go into an inlet, you would um, take as many fish as you can catch when you're, when kind of the cost benefit um, was low enough, so you took all these fish, and these are, by the way, um, per seine, uh, you would move on to the next cove. So you go from, from site to site to site, and you fish really hard in each individual site. And of course, people saw this, the Haida people. Um, Percy talked about how they used to go out and see boat after boat after boat getting lost getting loaded off of one set, it was common to catch 90,000 tons in a day in a single inlet. And Vince talked about how they fished every fish out of Reynolds Sound and Inskip, two different inlets. So they, so this, they came in there and they just basically wiped out the area. And if you look at biomass, you can kind of even see when they were fished. So this is Skidigat Inlet, which is one of two remaining Haida villages. Um, and you see the typical noisy time series. This is the year that it was fished, and then it basically has flat lines since and, and really has never really recovered in Skidigat Inlet. Um, the same is true for a number of other places. You can again see where there was fishing that happened because um, it's sort of flat lines. Other places you see it's doing okay. Um, and these are the places that are, are less fished. And what this has led to is an erosion of this portfolio effect. So that volatility, which was sort of um, uh, moderated over the entire site now is gone because we're basically reducing the number of sites. So site after site is disappearing. And so we're, what we're having is a, essentially a synchronization of the vari spatial variation. And so we're losing that portfolio effect. And so why is that happening? Um, this is where, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this 
later are inclusion of high up folks in our working groups has been critical. Um, and there's one story that was basically summarized that once hearing lost the elders, the older hearing, they, the juveniles lost their way to the spawning grounds. And what um, in that case, Chief Gadanso was talking about was learned migration, which happens in a number of species of fish. So the idea is that rather than sort of imprinting on a site like salmon does or something like that, fish, juvenile fish follow older fish to spawning grounds and they learn where the spawning grounds are simply by following older fish. Fisheries target older fish. When the older fish are gone, the younger fish have no idea where to go. They end up just following older fish that are going to a different site, perhaps, than they were born. And so that site fidelity is lost and the characteristics of the individual site are lost. And you can show this in some modeling why this is important. So in this case, we have two scenarios a learned migration um, scenario, so we're, we're actually taking the stories and turning them into a, a model and comparing them against a diffusion model, which is how it's typically modeled. First thing is you can see that um, this, the blue line tells us that the maximum catch that we could take is much higher with the status quo modeling than if we paid attention to learned migration, the, the traditional knowledge of that area. Um, and secondly, on the right here, what you see is the effective number of sites that are that hold herring. So what happens with diffusion is you increase fishing mortality and you slowly lose those sites. With learned migration, um, you have an immediate loss of sites. So you have this sequential depletion. And that seems to be what we observe, which comports very well with the traditional knowledge of that area. And so, um, why is this important? Because hearing is central to everything. Um, and here's one example of that, which f for me has been very powerful. So Roberta Ol Olson, who's a elder, talked about growing up and mostly women got it. So mostly women got the herring row on the kelp. So they used to row out to different places, load up their little skiffs and row back home and spread it out the beach at low tide and have it dry on the rock and then bundle it up and put it away for the winter. This was a time when women and children would gather on the beach and, part and, and conduct the harvest of herring row on kelp cow. This was a time when stories were transferred, songs were taught, history was taught. This was a time when women were empowered, where everybody was able to, to get this resource and share it with their neighbors. It was central to everything. Um, and we asked people um, if they were getting enough herring, and, and the answers were kind of interesting. This was uh, two years well, last year. Um, and so th this is just really simply presented. Um, basically, if it's blue, you're kind of getting enough or neutral. So in this case, women, 75% um, women were not getting enough. 25% were men. Um, the picture is different. Here you can see that um, this minus two score, the worst score is only a few percentage of population. And a lot of the people feel like they were getting enough compared to, to women. So female or female Haida are really feeling the loss of the herring. And this is particularly true in, in older females. So if you lived in Haida Gwaii for more than 25 years, you see the deficiency scores quite high. Whereas the younger residents, you see the opposite. Um, and then we also asked about where they visit. So Guayanas is the area of Haida Gwaii where there's still abundant herring. It's about a six hour boat ride. Who goes there? Men go there frequently or sometimes. Women very rarely go there or never, the majority. So 
simply by shifting the spatial distribution of the herring. Yeah, I mean, technically there's enough herring, um, but it's lost from the village sites and you have to go six hours by boat. Who's going there? Men. So simply by changing the spatial distribution of the herring, we've changed the role of women in society and the ability to transfer that knowledge from generation to generation. Um, and this, for me, makes me think again about all the different pillars of sustainability, not just straight up fisheries and ecological sustainability that we often think about, but all these other aspects of sustainability. And this is, um, was one of the topics of the Ocean Modeling Forum working group that we put together where you see um, it was highly transdisciplinary with folks uh, from different scientific disciplines, but also elders and chiefs and members of uh, the fishing industry all together co-creating um, some um, science. Um, and I'm just gonna just hit on a couple like really brief examples that came out of this group that um, for me begin to um, show that, well, I'm not gonna tell you what sustainable is because um, again, for, for the obvious reasons, but, um, I think we can develop tools that support decision making about sustainability across multiple objectives a lot better than we currently do. So in this case, we we have a model that we built, um, again, co-created with all the members of our group. And just to give you a quick sort of flavor of this, this is from this is from a uh, Dan Okamoto's paper last year, where we're um, basically taking different harvest rates working with the community, we're able to translate the consequences of harvest for traditional practice, community values, um, and also some more traditional um, uh, fisheries metrics. And, and so we can begin to see, well, what's the consequence of these sorts of, of cultural how important to people. And then we can think about then how do we um, uh, develop strategies that allow maximizing cultural outcomes as well as economic and ecological. Um, and you can do that, that with straight up harvest. You could, you could think about closed areas. And, um, and, and so again, I'm not really gonna go into the details of these particular outcomes just to say that you've got to work. Um, and to me, it was very satisfying to begin to work with the community to take the tools of traditional fishery science and begin to make them relevant to what their needs were at that time. And the other thing we did in this group um, that I won't do full justice to is to talk about how, how we in, can incorporate governance into our thinking about these sorts of things. In this case, I'm imagining here we have um, collaborative governance, which there's lots of different reasons why that sort of model of governance would work better than a you know top-down governance structure, which is typical um, in this location currently. Um, and we think about this in terms of this, how we think about the status of the stock, the decisions that are made, the activities around harvesting and the dynamics of the ecosystem. Um, what we really focused on was two consequences of collaborative government. One is around compliance. And so our work in this area showed that collaborative governance would lead to more compliance with rules. Um, but that comes at a cost, which we labeled as inertia here, which is basically um, it's less efficient. Um, and so management can't act instantly to say scientific, new scientific information that's coming in. So there's a bit of um, a lag uh, between the data and a management action. And we can, you can play all kinds of games with models where you look at the parameter space. In this case, we're looking at percent of years fisheries closed, given different scenarios um, driven by um, hypothetical collaborative governance models. And so you can say, okay, this is the amount of compliance I'm gonna have, this is the amount of inertia in the system, and therefore, um, here are some outcomes. Um, so one can look at sustainability using our existing tools across lots of different dimensions. Oftentimes we just don't. 
So returning to sort of this idea of what is sustainability, I um, was struck by this paper by Ray Hilborn um, in this quote from it where he says, if a management system can provide food for For this generation, future generations to produce food. Let us call this sustainable seafood. And I think that's a reasonable, you know, definition of sustainability. Um, but when I thought about that, I just sort of asked the question, whose food are we talking about? Are we talking about food for um, commercial fisheries, for recreational fishers? Are we talking about food available to support culture? Are we talking about food to support the ecosystem? And I'd argue that our culture and fishery science especially um, leads us to operationalize this notion of sustainability that supports a pretty conventional way of thinking, unidimensional, I would say. Um, and so we go out and do all this stuff to get data Um, right, you take a boat, you go, you drag a net, you catch the fish, you count the fish, and you do that a lot. Um, in my area um, where I work, here are some examples. There's hundreds of stations sampled every year, almost 300 days at sea every year doing a survey, tens of thousands of otoliths collected. There's some years where you know, 100,000 fish were measured all to get this information to support this one pillar of sustainability. So we end up getting a very relatively precise estimate of what is sustainable for that one aspect of sustainability. And if we look at where our money is spent, you know, that sort of shows. So in terms of um, this was um, my old uh, group. So Basically, 75, 80% of our budget was spent on single species science surveys and assessments, a little bit on ecosystem science and almost nothing on social science. So that kind of, to me, reflects our values, right? We value um, this single species notion of sustainability more than others because that's where we spend our money. So that brings me back to the little girl in the airplane. You know, are we trapped as fishery scientists in our own internal logic about the way it works that's demonstrably wrong? And then if we can open our eyes and see things from alternative perspectives, that we would really begin to reframe how we see things and you know like we want to put things in silos we need to organize the world we need to separate our cells separate our data we have this huge amount of data coming in we need to organize it that's what we like to do um but it, it comes with a huge cost and i show a picture of a walkman here um because this is an example of just the perfect you know it's like why this is dumb so you may know that um, Walkmans used to be a thing, and you may also know they're no longer a thing. What happened? Well, Sony had three silos in their business model. They had the, the device thing, they had music, and they had software. And they were in separate silos, and the institution was set up in a way that they were actually competing competing with each other for limited resources. And what happened was Walkmans imploded and are now like probably in museums. I guess for me, when I think about silos and sort of this, these institutions and the lack of communication and our inability to really communicate effectively across some of these silos, I get sad because to me, you know, I don't miss, uh, the Walkman, to be honest, I have my iPhone. I'm quite happy with my iPhone, but I don't want this to happen to the ocean. Um, and I think that our inability to think clearly 
across all of our disciplines and outside of our academies means that we're not really fully considering what sustainability is and what it could be. And as a consequence, um, I think we don't always make the wisest decisions. And so I kind of leave with this notion that, you know, we can break down the silos. We know how to do it. And it's a matter of actually doing it. And I think we'll begin to reach um, more sustainable outcomes more quickly if we can do that. And I will stop there. Thanks.